Chris Columbus in studio. What's up, ah, sir? Chris Columbus. Welcome Take aboard. a seat, sir. We'll get right, back to your... Take a seat. We're just learning that Anthony here... I uh, got a velociraptor He just got a dinosaur backyard. for his backyard. A it's like dinosaur. Well, it's a life-size it's velociraptor. Well, it might as well be a real one. Is it, for, is it a piece of shrubbery or it's something? It's like a lawn ornament. Oh, okay. But it's, but but it's, it's, it's life like size. five feet tall. Oh, okay. So it's really... It looks, it looks more than five feet tall. Badass. It might be a little tall than five feet, but it's, it's pretty cool. It's like an actual size of what they were, and it's in my backyard now. It looks very... um. Very festive. Thank you, sir. But that's what you walked. Thank you. I was just. That's what you walked into. That's all. Yeah, we were just. We wanted to make you feel comfortable. I feel comfortable. I like this studio. Yeah, yeah. it's nice and small and intimate. <laughs> we had a larger one, but you know, we had a massive studio. Uh, studio so, yeah, but yeah. Whatever. Wow, you. But uh, you know, you paw through your resume. There's quite a few motion pictures that people have uh, enjoyed over the years. Oh, thank you. I gotta yeah. tell you. Yeah, it's a little shocking when yeah. I look at it. I try to forget about a lot yeah. of it, just yeah. so you can continue to move forward. But yeah, it's kind of nice. What was the first one that you were like, "Wow, well, I think I'm on my way here"? It was actually Gremlins. You Gremlins. Know, Gre Gremlins. Gremlins yeah. was written in a New York City loft here because I had a bunch of mice that I was I was actually worried were going to chew <laughs> off my fingers at night, uh, and I thought these little monsters are kind of scary. I wrote the script, sent it out to 50 producers and studios. No one picked wow. it up. Steven Spielberg was leaving, I think, on a Friday afternoon. Saw it sitting. On top of his desk, picked it up and read it. Come on, no, it's, I know no, I believe you. I believe you, but I have to just say no, that. No, I get a call. I'm 22 years old. I get a call on Jesus. 26th Street here. Uh, my roommate answers and says, uh, "Chris, it's Steven Spielberg," and I'm like, "Yeah, f bullshit. That's not Steven Spielberg." <laughs> exactly. And it was asking me to come out to LA to meet with him, and so that was. As Paul Newman said, it's sometimes about luck, you know, and it was kind of, that was a lucky moment for me. Yeah. That kind of settled it. Have you, you know? ever gotten to talk to the people that turned it down? I'm sure. They would never admit it. You know, it's yeah, typical yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, They're yeah, not yeah. going to admit it. They, you know. Right. Yeah, they screwed That was your there. first hit. <laughs> that was your first hit. What were you doing right before that? For I did a horrible movie called Reckless, uh, which Reckless. was written, it was sort of my love letter to Bruce Springsteen and the fact that I grew up in a fact in Youngstown, Ohio. In a factory town, and the director turned it into Last Tango in Weirton, West Virginia. So oh, oh. I remember sitting there. Uh, now these are high school kids, and they're having sex brilliantly, which, by the way, <laughs> doesn't exist in high school. <laughs> sex yeah, yeah. Little, for most of us. It's very awkward. But they're having this, and my agent turns to me during the screening, and I'm practically crying because this guy destroyed my film. <laughs> oh, and my agent turns to me and says, Academy Award nomination. And I said, are you out of your fucking mind? This is horrible. Right. So, um... Well, could, yeah, that, I, was a, that was a disaster before Kremlin. But I got a follow-up question. So you know that that was a good script in your own head, right? Right. And now that you're this famous, why not just try to really, you know, make it your vision? You mean that script? Yeah. Why yeah, not? I'll try to get back there. You know, I, I those kind of films have the, especially difficult to get because it sounds like you really believe mm. that he destroyed your vision and and messed and messed it up. He wouldn't let me on the set. That's how much he destroyed my wow. vision. Wow. So but you got to prove everyone, my first movie. So but yeah, you got to yeah. prove everyone wrong and redo it now. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of you know I don't have that <laughs> anger about that anymore because Gremlins <laughs> came immediately afterwards, right. so that was okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did only the lonely too. Uh, you, you just wrote that. I wrote it and directed it. No, oh, did you, okay. Mm. So did you? Uh, did you? Do you have John Candy in mind for that, or did you not write it? I that? met John because John came in on Home Alone. We were doing Home Alone, and we mm -hmm. needed a guy to play the polka guy, Gus Polinski. And John came in, and we shot twenty four hours with John. Mm. We literally shot twenty four hours all of his scenes in that movie. Wow. And John and I just hit it off. So I wrote only the lonely initially for an Italian guy, and then I changed it to an Irish American family, and got Maureen O'Hara back into the film business. And huh. John was maybe the nicest guy who ever lived, yeah. funniest yeah. guy I've ever met, truly hilarious, but also one of the sweetest guys in the world. One of his good best performances. Not a lot of people saw that movie. I agree. I thought it was with Ali Sheedy. I thought it was fucking fantastic. I thought he was very underrated as an actor. Like his serious moments and the things he did that were were non comedic. Those moments he was fantastic in. Oh, thanks. Yeah, he was great to work with. Yeah, he was amazing. What made you, what made you, being a writer, what made you say, like, eh, I could direct too? <laughs> uh, that was the, uh, you know, I was drilled into my head at NYU that you have to write in order to become a director. This is oh, before right, okay. the age of independent film. So for me, it was like they told me that if you write enough screenplays and they're successful and they get made, you can also become a director. Mm -hmm. So, and I wanted works. to, I don't like, <laughs> what's that? 
I guess it worked. It worked. I, didn't, I just didn't like sitting in a room. It felt so lonely just being yeah. in a room for 12 hours writing. Right. And I did it for a long I did it in, in, until I could direct it. What Adventure was the first uh, movie you directed? Uh, Adventures in Babies. Okay, no that kidding. was Adventures in Babies. Did you feel uh, Did you feel vulnerable? Did you feel like, oh, my God, are people going to listen to me? Were, were you a hard ass or were you kind of, eh? The first day I thought I was going to get fired. Really? I mean, That's I a lot st- of directors say that. Yeah, yeah, I still feel when I get onto the side, honest to God, I still feel like I'm going to get fired. <laughs> Still, still, it's still, it's that thing that haunts you. It's with you forever. So those first three days on Adventures in Babysitting, I thought they're going to see that I'm this big phony. That I'm <laughs> <laughs> broad, yeah. yeah, because I walked onto the set that first day. I'll never forget. And I've been preparing for this moment for years. And it was, oh my god, what am I? What the fuck what am I going to do? Doing? I forgot everything I had wow. learned, oh, and then I, I had to. You know, it took about five minutes to get out of that. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, that was a te- that was a terrifying moment, but it was a fun movie to do because I got to work with some great people like yeah, Albert yeah. Collins, the, you know, the blues singer. Yeah, of course. But it's not always translatable. Like Stephen King writes, um, is a genius writer, but when he gets into the screenplay aspect oh, of it, yeah, it, it just doesn't work. Shit. Like for some <laughs> reason, he, I, his visions of his work is not as good as like Kubrick's vision of his. Yeah, work. if you look at uh, well, Maximum people, Overdrive in I, comparison with um, Shawshank, <laughs> you know, he wrote both of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was just going to bring up Maximum Overdrive. Yeah, I'm yeah, glad yeah, you did. That was called go. Trucks, I think. Yeah, the original yeah, that was the short, short story. story. Was Trucks. Bubba. Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption yeah. was the short story. Yeah. I'm boring everyone, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who know Rita Hayworth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Maybe. There's, maybe um, there's a few. Yeah, you yeah. never know. A, right. I, they probably made a good move changing the title and shortening it to just Shawshank <laughs> Redemption. It's just my opinion. Good, 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 good move there, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wanted to commend you. And say, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to pitch you against Stephen King. I didn't do a movie about mad trucks, right? Uh, no, I like the fact that you're able to translate into directing. It's oh, not, it's not, no, it's just not easy. Upset. It's just because I was my upset. I really wanted to do it. Yeah. And you went the whole route with going to school. and, and I went to NYU, NYU. yeah. Yeah, I went to yeah. NYU, lived here for 17 years, and then moved out to San Francisco, did a picture, and kind of fell in love with that city and moved my family there. I was Mrs. Yeah. Doubtfire, so I Mrs. Really Doubtfire, oh, a little yeah, film yeah. called uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, yeah. You uh, directed that, or yeah, I directed it. Yeah, which oh, was an yeah. exercise in documentary filmmaking because uh, Robin, at his most energetic and manic, uh-huh. would do two or three scripted takes and then would veer off. So we had two it, or three yeah. cameras on at all times because the other actors never had any idea what he was doing. The first time I le- edited a film electronically, we shot over a million feet of film and we had <laughs> everything from the G-rated version to the NC-17 rated version of the film. <laughs> so uh, that was a great experience, but a grueling experience. Was anybody able to kind of, because he really is um, brilliantly, when, he, when he's going off on a weird tangent, like was anybody able to kind of keep up with him and go with the scene or did he kind of lose everybody? I Every actor, I well, remember I had pros, I, I talked to the actors beforehand, so I had Sally Field and Pierce Brosnan and they were yeah. really able to keep up with him. It was exhausting for them though as well. You yeah, know, they yeah. Never knew, you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth and you never, he never repeated it. So the script supervisor's like scribbling oh, madly. Christ, right. She was sweating. I thought she was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> keep up with him, you know. <laughs> he's a he's a really good actor. Like I I love his his serious acting. Even though uh, Miss Doubtfire was brilliant in that, but uh, I like his acting more than his st- I ever did his stand up. He was great in Good Will Hunting. He's a great actor. Yeah, you know? and amazing. he'll continue to do some great mm-hmm. films. Yeah, I heard yeah. he made so much money off Good Will Hunting because he had an amazing back end deal. That when his next uh, bonus was about to kick in, that they had to just pull it out of the theater because it would have been too expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> like, like if they kept it in the theater, he would have had to hit another or something like that. that. I forget where I read that, but I was like, that's because he made that movie, you know, because Matt Damon and Ben Affleck weren't known at that time. So it's the fact <laughs> that Robin won the Oscar for it. Right. He made that movie a lot of money. It's a good. Uh, just a little background on uh, on the name. My name? On your name, yeah. My father, uh... Sounds familiar. What's that? It sounds familiar. Rings a bell. Let me tell you something. My father, (laughs) uh... My father, who, you know, he was in a coal mining community, had uh, 12 kids, right? In his family, Italian-American, Italian immigrants. Back then, when the woman had a baby, she'd go into the hospital. Bam, she's out. Drugs. He's out drinking. He comes back to the hospital, (laughs) names the kid either... Christopher or Christina, based on the sex of the baby. (laughs) Grandmother gets up, changes the name. I'm born 
My dad says it's long lost wish of your grandfather to be named Christopher, so I get the name. Now, some people think I'm an asshole. Like, I've changed, <laughs> I've changed my name to this. I'm like, are you kidding me? You think that I would actually change my name to Chris Columbus? Like, and I want to be considered a serious filmmaker? Right, right. Jesus, it's like changing your name to Barney Fife. I was like, this is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. So I... <laughs> yeah, I just, but I didn't want to be a jerk and change my name, so right. I kept it. So that's how it existed, and you know, there's nothing I can do about you it. You should actually put a T at the end and call yourself Christ Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, that, that's something Bono would do. Exactly. Your novel, a book. A book that in 1999 was a script. I, I wrote the first 90 pages of a screenplay called Stones of Time, not House of Secrets. And by the time I got to page 90, it was a $500 million movie. <laughs> so I put it in a drawer and went off to do the Potter films. Came back four years later. You know, I couldn't get the idea out of my head. Looked at the, uh, at the manuscript again, maybe a television series. And mm. again... Too expensive. Wow! But yeah. I, I really couldn't get the idea out of my head. And about two years, two and a half years ago, I thought maybe a novel. But I don't want to. I, I couldn't lock myself in a room for a year and a half and, and ignore the film yeah. business. So I found this co-writer, a guy named Ned Vizzini. He's a brilliant young writer. I gave him the first ninety pages. Said, "See if there's something here." A week later, he sent me his the first chapter, the first eight pages of the novel. I liked it. I rewrote it. Sent it back to him. Bounced it back and oh, forth. Wow. Kind of as a hobby before we knew it, we had a hundred pages. Wow. And we took it to a um, we took it to a publisher, and now it's in, in twelve to fourteen languages or something. So wow, it's man. very exciting, and it is the uh, people are like, "Well, it, what is it like Harry Potter?" Well, it's got a little of that in it, but it's mostly a thematic sequel to the Goonies because oh, shit. Wow. all these years, and I didn't take it when the Goonies was released. I didn't take it that seriously. I liked the movie. But I was more of a fan of Gremlins. I'm like, I kind of like Gremlins a little better. And I was into young Sherlock Holmes, which I was writing at the time. Yeah, that was really, so I kind of ignored yeah. the Goonies. And then once I got to London, all these 23-year-olds are coming up to me on the set saying, you know what movie changed my life, mate? And I'm like, Home Alone, Mrs. Dot. They're like, The Goonies. It just meant that. <laughs> and it didn't stop. Then I started getting all these letters about The Goonies. It became more than a cult. People yeah, were becoming yeah. obsessed with it. And there's like... When is there going to be a sequel? And I said, they're 35 years old. It would be a sad fucking sequel <laughs> to have these 35 year olds on bikes looking for treasure. So uh, I was like, I can't do that. So I said, I said, this House of Secrets is, you know, takes the spirit of the Goonies, but gives these three kids a brand new adventure to go. Mm -hmm. By the way, I disagree. I think 35 year olds on a bike looking for treasure would, be, would be an be, amazing that would sequel. Be awesome. All right, I'll start writing that. As soon as I leave it. A little more tragic though. That would be kind. Of yeah, but did you build in some kind of a great backstory? Like, you know what I mean? None of them are allowed to drive because of DUIs. <laughs> Real confined dark, to the yeah. same neighborhood because of Megan's Law. Just a phenomenal backstory. <laughs> Looking for treasure. <laughs> so, uh, why would it have been a $500 million movie if would you just saw where it was going? Yeah, the effects were just too incredibly outrageous. Now, mm. of course, since visual effects are getting a little cheaper, right. there's a possibility it can be a movie someday, but we'll see. It, great, it will be a movie someday. There's that's, a great endorsement awesome. by J.K. Uh, Rowling, which is really probably not easy to get on a book. No, she's uh, <laughs> it's extremely difficult, but I sent, you know, I, I know her pretty well, and I sent her the book just to get advice on it, and she came back and said, you gotta slow down the pace a little, add some more character stuff. Oh, wow. And so we took that to heart, and then a couple of weeks later, I, she sent me this quote, which was wow. really... So she actually read the book. It's weird. Like, you figure a lot of people wouldn't take the time to read it when they're worried about their own, I guess, multi trillion dollar franchise. <laughs> well, certainly, you know, most studio executives these days won't read anything over four pages. So I don't know yeah, how yeah. ever read this. Uh, but yeah, she read it. She's, she loved it. And was the advice she gave you was good? It was good. You know, we were, we were working at such a fast pace that we had missed certain things in the book and we went back and fixed those things. What were the character development things? Or character things? development things, dialogue things. Some logic things, yeah. I always think it's odd when you have a franchise of a movie and different directors direct different um, installments of it. What did you think of the ones, uh, the the Harry Potters that you didn't direct? Uh, I, you know, it was interesting at the time. It was not a, you know, at the time we had so, sort of the weight of the world on our shoulders, and I'm not saying that. It's, 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 there know, were some big easy. expectations. That's the, you know, as a, as a filmmaker, you are everybody's looking at you like, who are you going to cast? Who's going to, mm -hmm. you know. How, how, what is Quidditch going to look like? Those are the kind of things that were on on my mind for a long time. When we were making the first movie, so the first movie was not a barrel of fun. You know, we were really yeah. Because if we screwed that up, uh, 
there would be no second Harry wow. Potter movie. Yeah. And it was too expensive, <laughs> and we would have torpedoed the whole series. I wasn't wow. thinking about that every day, or else I probably would have ne never left my house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, Man. So that was a little intense. Once the first movie came out on a Friday, and we realized that it was successful, that Monday we started shooting the second movie. So it was that quick. Wow. But, wow. but yeah. literally, the second movie then became a lot of fun and became even though it was a darker film for me a lighter experience you just know that yeah hey we're we're off and running we're okay and, yeah, yeah, yeah people have responded to it people like the movie so that that was good and then on the uh, you know that they were two movies 160 days each for me back to back and i thought i was going to direct all seven i thought oh i have unlimited energy not the case i was you know physically <laughs> and mentally i was exhausted i could barely put two words together after finishing the so first were you two. supposed to do the third yeah i was going to do the third and you just and tapped out you said i said steve Clover said to me, you got to read Prisoner of Azkaban. It's my best script. I said, Steve, there's no way I can do this. I, you know, I got to yeah. see my kids again before they're, you know, can you they're imagine driving tapping me around. Out of, tapping so, out of the Harry Potter I, series? Yeah. It's but amazing I produced to the me. third one. I, I produced the You're third. You're still in, but... Yeah, I was there. You know, I could, that, that way I could work eight hours a day as opposed to 16. <laughs> right. Um... Wow. As I, yeah, I'm sorry, were you able to get you creatively? You had some kind of input, though, in that one? Every too? day, yeah. Oh, okay. We had input on who was going to be cast, and uh, it, yeah, it was. Just um, the day to day. Uh, but I did like, you know, uh, Joe, J.K. Rowling's idea, her concept was constantly to make these films darker and darker. Yeah. We yeah. knew when we first met and talked about it that each book was going to get darker. So that, we set that into motion in, initially, you know, with the first two movies. The second movie's a little darker, a little more desaturated mm -hmm. in color. Third movie hmm. gets a little darker. So, yeah, I've. I've been very impressed by what the other directors in, have done, and particularly impressed by how great the kids have become as actors. You know, were you yeah. part of all seven in the end? No, so no, you were I done just, after three. After three, I moved back Direct to the states. Yeah, two and produced the third. Yeah. Gotcha. A lot of your movies too. Uh, there's that youthful theme that goes through yeah. uh, a lot of your your. Uh, screenplays and whatnot. Are you kind of in a state of arrested development <laughs> throughout I your probably, life? Probably. You... you know, I'm still, you know, that's the problem. I still <laughs> have the heart of a 10 year old and yeah, the mind yeah. of a 10 year old boy, uh, <laughs> which can get you into trouble at times. But I, I, I just, uh, you know, I love that particular side of filmmaking. I, I love to sort of create those things that kids will, you know, be able to watch for 20 years. Mm -hmm. That, on the other hand, you know, we did a picture uh, called The Help last, a couple of years ago that oh, right, yeah, really yeah. opened up. For me, as a filmmaker, seeing that it's possible to make a film that is, you know, about character and about conflict and about something sort of deep, and, and audiences showed up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of rare. It's not Transformers. It was The Help. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I thought, well, there's still... And then this year, you get inspired by movies like Argo and, and Beasts of the Southern Wild, and movies that people are actually going to see. And maybe the business is changing a little bit. Maybe people are getting a little tired of that. So House of Secrets is the stuff I've always been doing, but I get to do that as a book. And then uh, from a film perspective, hopefully I'll have a career like Clint Eastwood. You know, as Clint <laughs> was doing movies about fighting chimpanzees 20 years ago, now <laughs> yeah. he's one of the greatest living directors. So I'm, you know, I'm still hungry. I've got, uh, you know, I really have about 20 years left, I hope, of making some good movies. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, is there any it. genre that you haven't really gone into directing-wise that you want to? Or anything? Well, you know, I didn't direct the help, but I was on the set. You know, I promised Spielberg I'd be there every day because it was a first-time director, so I was on yeah, the set every Spielberg. day. I had to promise him I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Good setup. Yeah, right? Uh, but, yeah, so I was... Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of genres, but it depends on the movie. The movie right. has to be great. I've gotten myself into trouble <laughs> when I, because I get to that point where I get very anxious about directing. I want to get back on the set. It's just in my blood. Mm -hmm. So if a good script doesn't come along in about 16 months or two years, I'll end up doing. That's why I did a movie like I Love You, Beth Cooper, which is not a movie I'm particularly proud of. Mm. We had a director, David O. Russell, was going to direct it. Suddenly he dropped out at the last minute. The studio oh, called me man. and said, Why don't you just do this? It'll be fun. It'll be a lark. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it, and I did it. And but you gotta not do. You gotta be sure. patient and say I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. You gotta know a studio is bullshitting when a studio says something will be a lark. It's probably <laughs> yeah. right. that's, not, that's not studio language. No, really. it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like sitting at poker and tossing so many hands in. After a while, you're just like, ah, I gotta play something. Right. You know, I'm yeah. tired of folding the whole time. Yeah. Exactly. But now I have to be patient. So I will yeah. be patient before I decide what I'm gonna direct next. Who's your favorite director when you were growing up? Like, who do you who do you look at and go, I wish I could do one thing as good as him? I think it was. You know, I grew up, uh, God, I grew up in the 70s, so I got to see some pretty great directors. You know, Sidney Lumet was one yeah. of the guys who I think is probably almost my favorite. Francis Ford Coppola, Scorsese, all the mm. guys from the 70s. Did you ever see Q&A by Lumet? 
Yeah, it was good. So many people haven't seen it with Nick Nolte. Nick and all that. That's a great movie. So many people. That's Nick Nolte's best thing. He plays a big tranny-loving Irish cop with a mustache, <laughs> and he's wearing lifts the whole time. It's fucking fantastic. <laughs> you really write a nice synopsis there, Jim. I, I, please, I felt like I was watching a fucking home movie. <laughs> <laughs> tranny-loving Irish cop? Well, without the cop part. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Sydney, that's great. How about Kubrick? Do you like Kubrick? I like Kubrick. You don't love him, though. I don't love him. I love Paths of Glory. I like movies that are emotional and have a, a mm. you know, I, I, but I do like him. You feel like he was overrated or you just no, not No, no, like not overrated. Style? I just, I respond to emotional directors. I love David Lean. I love Howard Hawks. I love Frank Capra. Um, I love Spielberg. But I, and I like Kubrick, but I think Kubrick's best films are his earlier films. I like Clockwork Orange. Mm. I like, uh, and I really do love Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory is one of the most emotionally devastating anti war films I've ever seen. I don't, I've saw it years ago. Is it Kirk mm. Douglas? Or, Kirk Douglas, yeah, it's yeah, awesome. I haven't seen that many, many years. It's intense. Yeah. It's only 90 minutes. It's great. Which is the one? There's one of the old Kubrick movies where the uh, the bartender from The Shining, the guy who played Lloyd in The Shining, was in it. And I was like, he likes to reuse. Like, the father from Clockwork Orange was also in The Shining. He liked to reuse people. Yeah, I don't know that guy. Yeah. I don't know why I would ask about him. Yeah. I had a relationship with him. There's no reason for me to ask about a guy that had one scene in 1980. <laughs> 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 she was trying to sell a book, and I'm like, what about right. that guy that did one thing 42 years ago? Are you, are you a director that uh, a lot of takes, or are you like getting it like done pretty quickly? Well, after the Doubtfire experience, I like getting it done quickly. Done pretty quickly, um, yeah. You know, Robin is an exception. I'll do whatever I can to... Uh, but, yeah, I liked uh, these days two or three takes. Yeah? Definitely, you, yeah. You get frustrated if... Uh... Well, it's the Eastwood. Th Eastwood does... You know, I worked with crew guys who said they would... Eastwood would do one take, and the cameraman would say... Clint, we we panned a light and the sound man. He goes, I don't care, move on. So he, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm there where I would just go. Move well, forward. a gentleman There's of his size would move a wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, two or three takes is good. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Mm. So Eastwood's one of those guys that just wants to get it done, and he kind of knows. I think Jay Moore said that about him. Like he knows yeah, what he Jay wants Moore when he has it. Stories on him. He yeah. knows when he has it. That's two it. takes, and he knows, and done. he th and the actors are prepared. So that's why he gets such good performances because the yeah. actors know they only got two yeah, shots. Only got two. Every shots actor will say, "Can I have a fifth or a sixth or a sure. seventh? If you indulge them, you never know what you have. Yeah. And plus, it's Eastwood. You, you don't want to look like an asshole for that Clint Eastwood because I don't think there's any actor. Like, are there actors? I mean, even though you're the director, there's got to be some actors that if you're working with, you're like uh, a little tentative around because of their like if you're working around a De Niro or a Pacino or no. Oh God, yeah. You know, <laughs> I was doing a. Uh, I, I had to talk to De Niro about a movie that we were p potentially going to do about a year ago. And his assistant said to me, just, Bob loves to talk on the phone. Just call him. And I'm like, can't I just oh. email him? I don't really yeah. want to call him. Bob. <laughs> I'm like, he's, he's like, no, no, call him. He loves to talk. So I was dying because it was De Niro. It was sure. raging full. It was you were hoping for the machine to pick up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, hello. hi, Chris. And, and, But he was the nicest guy in the world. But I had to call him about five or six times. And each time, I couldn't get all of those performances out of my head. Yeah. You know, it's hard to... I think Pacino would be somebody like that as well, you know. Um, mm. It's it's and Clint Eastwood would certainly be the most intimidating guy in the world. But for him, I don't think there's any actors that he would have that reaction. Like like that's probably why they know not to fuck around because yeah. it's like there's no actor that's going to alpha male Clint Eastwood on his set. I mean, well, that's the good thing about being that old is you've outlived <laughs> everyone else. So yeah. you're dealing with a bunch of young guys who aren't yeah. going to go up against you. you know? Yeah, they probably all look up to him. Yeah, exactly. See, that's why I'm good with Hollywood people, because I know all the inside stuff. Clint Eastwood's popular. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you, uh, early on, did you uh, write or direct any episodic television? No, uh, I never did. You never, never did, did any television. Do you, no. look, do you look at that like, fuck? No, not at all. <laughs> Particularly today. I yeah, mean, yeah, back yeah. in the day, yeah, it was probably when I was twenty three. I thought wouldn't want to do a love boat. <laughs> now, yeah, back then it was love boat and Alf. But now, uh, you know, TV is almost better than the Breaking movies Bad, the Game of Breaking Thrones, Bad. things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, I mean, I got here last night and I, I ran straight to the apartment and watched Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. So yeah. I just, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm obsessed with that. stuff. I'm two weeks behind. Oh, so I won't oh, yeah. tell you what happened. Yeah, yeah please don't. Okay. It's May. Yeah, but I, I really is amazing how many great things there are now on cable, on oh, regular just, TV, not too many. Yeah, it's amazing. With, it's with, stuff you can't. Get it movie, in was movie it theaters. a uh, was it a conscious decision not to write or direct for television early? Because I I mean a lot of directors did start even even Spielberg you know with the uh, uh, Night Gallery and things like that. Um, you know I just had somebody who drilled it into my head. You have to write movies. You have to write movies. Really? You know? And back then movies were that was it. You know yeah, television yeah. was not great back then. No. Except for Saturday Night Live. You know yeah, maybe yeah. Hill Street Blues or something. But now 
Like I said, you, it's a renaissance for television. Oh, yeah. yeah. When you're writing a film, because I've written little things before, like scripts and stuff, but not a film script. Ransom right. letters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's just, do you uh, do you ever do you have an idea of what your beginning, middle, and end is going to be? Like, okay, this is kind of where I want to go, or you just go, this is a good idea. I hope I find something. <laughs> that doesn't suck to end it with? Or do you yeah. kind of see the whole thing first? There's so much that sucks, and I have drawers of s s things that suck. <laughs> but, uh, Me too, I'm wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you have to take the shot, and sometimes you get 30 or 40 pages into something, and you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever read. Oh, shit. Really? Yeah, but you just have to do it. You yeah, gotta take yeah. the shot. And, and, but there are also people who will tell you not to do certain things. I remember when I had the idea for Gremlins, Every one of my friends said, God, you're such an asshole. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> and you have to break through all that. Same thing with Mrs. Doubtfire. I had people saying, are you out of your mind? Really? That's horrible. And I, you just have to see, you know, that there's yeah, an ending, yeah. you Yeah, know. yeah. Wow, that's that's ballsy to not get like, all right, you're, you're right, this sucks. Right. And, and I wish someone would have said that about Bicentennial Man. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw Bicentennial Man. Did you not like the way it came out? It was kind of a uh, not a great movie. You know, there's certain movies I've done, and I, I've been knocking that movie for a while. But it's it's uh -huh. really because we got, you get into it for the wrong reason. Like I said earlier, uh, I was, I, Rob and I had just done Mrs. Doubtfire, and he did a great cameo in nine months and we're talking and we said we should work together again it'd be fun there's a script by centennial man the script was not ready oh, we said well we'll yeah. do it anyway we get into the middle of it and there's a whole boatload of issues and problems wow. with the material so uh i avoided that pitfall again as well oh, okay mm. well, does he not like it either oh robin bust you know in his stand-up he'll always bring out oh. by centennial man. <laughs> I think I was first, though. I'll take credit for being the first guy to jump on that movie. But I like the guy who will criticize his own stuff, because then you know it's genuine when you yeah. say that you like something. Right. You have to be a dick to come uh, to really, honestly, and there are a lot of them in Hollywood, a guy who would say, well, you know, I love all of them like they're my babies. Well, they're not really your babies. Some of them are, you know. Yeah, there's somebody else's babies. Somebody else's babies that you don't want to see, yeah. Someone right. screwed this one up. Are you a, uh, uh, um, like, Technical uh, uh, modern guy with a computer, or you use a pen still? When you're uh, I I'll do. Uh, I'm doing something on E Street Radio later, and I had to. You know, I, I did the, all that longhand. And when I write, you know, but when I when I was writing the book, it was all computer. It was okay, all yeah. emailing back and forth. The writer and I have only met each other five times in person. Isn't that amazing wow. how th that's gotten to where yeah. you can just exchange ideas instantly like that? A lot of musicians do that too. You just take a, a file. Send it to somebody. They throw it in the studio and lay down guitar tracks to it. Send it off to the next guy. Yeah, and, and you could get an entire uh, song done, uh, an album done, without the band ever meeting. <laughs> it's kind of amazing, you know. Yeah. I mean, Ned and I, we said at the outset, it's kind of, it's not the Clint Eastwood thing, certainly. But I've been, you know, I'm 20 years older than my co-writer, and he again is a Goonies fan and loves all that stuff. And and I said to him, look, if I send you a chapter, feel free to edit it cut dialogue, do whatever you want. There's no ego about it, and you should feel I feel the same way about what I do to your stuff. Don't be concerned about that. And we had a good relationship. There were never any fights. You know? Wow, yeah. See, I find collaboration to be so hard. Like, I, I, I hate when people change my word. Like, it's really... Hmm. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know how you do that. I admire the ability to do that because that's a much better way to, to work creatively. It's it's just a matter. It's you have to do it in the film business all the time. I mean, the most important part of a long career in the film business is, is collaboration. Yeah, if you're not yeah. collaborative and you're fighting. You can be a jerk and fight for something that's wrong. <laughs> I've seen that happen. I've seen right. people fight for a bad idea. <laughs> well, what's the point? Just you pick your battle their against, idea. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to pick the pick the ones you're gonna fight for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hate when people change my, my. I don't know why I just said yeah. that twice. Because yeah. you really hate it. I know, but I, I, I said it once. You all thought you your, fought, your you, ears fell off. You all heard it. That's why you reiterated. You acknowledged it, and I just had nothing else to say. So I'm like, always repeat. That's popular in a conversation. Sounds <laughs> an idiot. Uh, but uh, the book is called House of Secrets, and you're obviously a great and prolific writer, and and and, and worker. So uh, this is a book I'll read. We just got yeah. this today, or I would have been. This more is prepared. the advanced copy. You guys should get the the hardcover. Looks cool. I'm like a book geek and nerd and when it can mm. when i got it on my desk there's like a nice solid hardcover with illustrations mm. it's really cool. i like the advanced great, copy yeah. sign though because no one else has that okay i'll oh. sign it for you i don't sell it i just keep it for of me of course you do yeah. he's got a museum at his house i really right. do it's i just show girls yeah. i'm like look at this she's like what is that i'm like oh. <laughs> 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 wonderful <laughs> okay <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Good way to wrap things up, Jim. Yeah, well, Thanks. you know, um, uh, Chris. Chris Columbus wow, is great, Chris, guys. Great. What a Absolutely. blast. This was fun. Thank you, guys. Fun. Right. Really cool. I think we're done, too, huh? This, yes. uh, this uh, uh, Saturday night, I will be at the Moon Tower uh, <laughs> Festival in Austin performing. And Friday night, I'm doing Marin's live podcast in uh, Austin. So if you want to see me, I'll be there. If not, ignore that. And uh, I guess we'll see everybody tomorrow. Chop, chop. Yes, thanks. The